All right, we are live. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of the Illinois Green Party series. I'm your host, David Rich, airing from my bedroom. Isn't that cool? All right, so we have a very special guest on tonight. I'm very, very excited about this. We have B. Sydney Smith, or otherwise known as Sid Smith. Hello, sir. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you for having me on. I'm excited, too. Good, good, good. So, um, we have much to discuss and some really, really interesting things. I just, you know, in, in doing research for guests on or, or just topics on this uh, for this show, I stumbled across some really interesting people. And recently, you are the one that I stumbled upon um, watching your video about uh, the mathematics and science of collapse. And we'll get to that in a bit. However, uh, Sid is a resident of Virginia um, and he is a member of the Green Party out there. And so why don't we start with you talking about your participation in the Green Party, how you got there, why you got there and what's going on? Sure. Um, I became a Green Party supporter in 2012 um, and uh, was because I was very excited about the the uh, Stein Hunkala um, campaign in 2012 and donated to it and followed it. and so on and so forth. I wasn't yet a member of the party, but I was very much aware of it and, and very much felt myself a supporter. And then when the, when the election was over, I thought, well, okay, so I should probably try to you know, get involved in some way. And I sought out my uh, state party, Virginia uh, Green Party, um, and started to go to meetings and got involved and eventually became an officer. And um, by 2016, I was a co-chair uh, of the Green Party of Virginia, and that was very exciting with the 2016 election uh, campaign. We had Jill out here a couple of times and hosted her, and I introduced her, and that was all very, very nice. <clears throat> um, and I started to go to national meetings. Um, I went to the uh, the nominating convention in 2016 in Houston, and then uh, subsequent meetings uh, nationally, got on the national committee, started to do committee work, you know, just sort of became more and more and more active and, and really enjoying it. Um, and uh, that continued, I would say, up until about 2019. And then I had some personal issues, things in my own life that required my much greater attention and my bandwidth began to narrow uh, quite significantly. And uh, so by 2021, <clears throat> I had simply reached the point where I didn't have the, the bandwidth to be able to give much. So I'm, I'm still active in my state party. I'm still the general secretary of the Green Party of Virginia. Um, but I'm, I'm actually, I'm slowly moving away. You know, I've given a number of years. I've reached a certain age and I have certain responsibilities where um, now I think I need to, to pass that baton on. But I'm still a firm believer in the principles of the Green Party. I think it's the only sensible political party in the country. Um, and uh, I certainly hope that it, uh, it starts to be more successful. All right. Well, very well said. That's great. And uh, thank you for all you've done for the Green Party. And we understand that, or I understand that uh, uh, things happen. Um, and sometimes you got to move on. And, you know, principles you can keep with, you can carry principle, principles around all the time because they're abstractions. So, sure. you know. <laughs> you know. Well, it's very fun to belong to the only political party in the country that has principles. So I, you know, I noticed that too because I was actually a libertarian before mm -hmm. I turned to the Green Party because libertarians, mm -hmm. you know, if you line up lib ten libertarians and ask them one question, you're going to get nine different answers. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And they didn't seem to have anything going on when it came to the environment, which was always been a big issue for me since I was a kid. I've always not understood how people thought it was okay to like be, back. Right. That was more about pollution than it was climate change or mm -hmm. anything else. Mm -hmm. Just like why would you pollute? water in the air it's mm -hmm. stupid so you know <laughs> um but yeah no once i found the green party um that becoming discontent with the libertarian party which i was in the libertarian party for like eight months or something you know mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. i was like i know i was very impressed that they actually had formalized principles one through ten mm -hmm. here we go and then mm -hmm. you, they expand mm -hmm. on each of those um right. yeah it's fantastic so um okay well very cool um, so let's, let's talk about your, your YouTube video that I found. And well, you also mentioned earlier before, uh, we started airing that you are coming up with a new video. It's half finished. Want to start with that? Right. Well, so let me, let me sort of unpack how this all started. Um, um the thing that actually led me to the green party initially that, that mm -hmm. I sort of discovered it was I was becoming more and more interested in the trajectory of our own civilization. Um, our civilization has been collapsing. By our civilization, I mean industrial civilization. Okay. Um, uh, industrial civilization has been in collapse uh, mode for about 50 years now, starting around the 1970s, early 70s. 
Um, and uh, as that became more and more clear to me, I started to study it more and more deeply. And that's one of the things that led me to the Green Party. It was like, what, what are we going to do here? We need, you know, we, we need to take some political action. And, and obviously, it can't be based on what's best for GM. So um, that sort of pushed me toward the Green Party. Um, but I've been studying the trajectory of, of industrial civilization and and uh, for, for 20 years and, and writing about it and speaking on it for many years. Um, the first talk that I gave was at Virginia Tech in 2018. Um, and uh, I titled it Humanity, the Final Chapter. And I really focused on our, our impact on the environment. Uh, there was there was some impact there was some focus on on uh, social issues uh, and our social decline which is very important but I, in that talk i really focused on the environment um and then in 2019 they invited me back to give another talk which was kind of cool uh, i wasn't expecting that and so i took really a couple of months to sit down and really study hard and what i came up with was for the first time for myself really a synthesis of all the things that are um, that have to do with the collapse of industrial civilization and, and starting to make sense of all the things that are happening now, um, which have been coming for a long time, but are actually starting to unfold in real time. Um, and so that talk I, I titled How to Enjoy the End of the World, um, because one of the points that I made in it, one of the central points was that collapse is not only underway, but it's inevitable, it's unstoppable. And what we have to think about is not how to stop it, since that's not going to happen, but rather how to live with it and how to look toward the future and how to start laying the seeds of, of what comes next. Um, so that was the, where that whole how to enjoy the end of the world thing came from. That video went viral, which the other one had not done. And within a year, I had 100,000 views and a couple thousand followers and people emailing me every day with questions and, and uh, criticisms and other things and begging for another talk which COVID made impossible. There were scheduled more talks, but COVID made it impossible to go back to VT. So I decided to start learning how to make my own videos. Uh, and I did uh, spend a lot of time on that last year. And so there's now a new series of videos. The series is called How to Enjoy the End of the World. Um, and if you YouTube, uh, if Google it in my name, it'll, you'll, it'll come right up. Um, and so that's what I'm working on currently. There are uh, four videos I've made. There's another one that's in production now. Uh, the current one is called Why Civilizations Die. Um, and I, I really delve into exactly what the mechanisms are that cause civilizations to die, why they die, what is it that's unique about them that makes them do this. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's kind of how that all happened. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I turned my mic off. Um, okay, that's better. Um, yeah, no, I uh, I have a, a certain fascination with with collapse as well, and just uh, the intellectual part of me just wants to know the logistics of it. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the moral part of me he wants to know like how I deal with it. Um, you know, so uh, I certainly haven't seemingly haven't done as much uh, research as you have on it. So why don't you go ahead and tell us as well as you can as, as rationally because i know there's like mathematics and physics in, involved here um, sure uh, well i'll try not to make it sound like a college lecture um okay. <laughs> let, me, let me see if i can uh let me see if i can sort of just lay the lay the draw the big picture so to speak um so our civilization industrial civilization is only a couple of hundred years old and that's that's one of the first things to realize because most civilizations last you know, quite a few centuries as a rule. I mean, there's a lot of variability. Some of them burn out quickly. Some of them will go on for a thousand years. Some of them will go on for five or 600 years and then sort of collapse and then just sort of gestate for a bit and then reflower. I mean, China has done that over and over, just as an example. Egypt did it uh, a couple of times. You know, there was the, the old kingdom, the middle kingdom and the new kingdom. And in between things sort of turned to chaos, but then they recovered. Um, there are really... There are three features of civilization that we have to know about in order to understand why they collapse. Um, first of all, uh, we have a capacity for abstract language. Yes. And uh, you know, on this planet, so far as we know, we're the only species that has that capacity. And what it allows us to do is to create abstract social rules. 
Now, there are lots of social animals and they have social roles, right? So there's, you know, the alpha dog in a pack, so to speak, uh, um, the rooster in a, in a flock and so on and so forth. So having social roles isn't something that's unique to us by any means. But most of those social roles are all concrete, right? So the social role of parent um, or tribe member or leader depend upon the person who occupies that role. Once the person has gone, the role is gone. But we create abstract social roles like prime minister, right? And that prime minister is an abstract social role that is independent of whoever happens to be occupying it. Right. And our capacity to do that allows us to create a layer of complexity on top of our, our so to speak, native social nature um, that can grow. Um, and it grows in accordance with our capacity to solve problems. And this is the second essential feature of civilization. Civilizations are problem-solving machines. They came into being, um, before the show, we talked a little bit about the deep green resistance people and their, their concern about agriculture. And <clears throat> they're not wrong in this sense that, that agriculture was where civilization began. Civil, uh, agriculture was the solution to a problem. If you're a hunter-gatherer, it's really great as long as there's game and food. You know, you don't have to work too much, there's no bosses, plenty of time for song. But if the food gets scarce, if there's a couple of really bad years, right? And if the game fluctuates too wildly, then you've got a real problem. People starve to death. Um, agriculture solved that problem. Agriculture made it so you didn't have to worry about how food fluctuated because you could grow grain, you could store it in silos. Um, you could maintain your flock, feed them from the silos, and you always had meat and so on and so forth. It was the solution to a problem. Created all of its own problems, right? Like, you know, how to be successful at agriculture. That's a complicated business, how to take care of your animals, how to keep them from being eaten by predators and so on. And so this, this problem solving dynamic builds and builds and builds and builds. And our capacity to create abstract social roles gives us a very powerful tool for solving those problems. The downside of all that is that most problems are caused by solutions, right? So like the hunter gatherer didn't worry about the predators eating his prey animals unless they ate too many. But if you're the herder, you're very much worried about keeping the wolf away from the sheep. That's a problem that was created by the solution. Every solution brings with it its own set of problems. Most problems are caused by solutions. So those are the first two things. We have the capacity to create all these abstract social roles, and we are a problem-solving uh, system. That's what civilizations do. The third thing, and this is where all the physics and stuff comes in, uh, civilizations are dissipative structures. And I talk about this a lot in, that, uh, uh, in, in the new series particularly, but I also did in that second uh, the original How to Enjoy the End of the World video. A dissipative structure is a structure that grows in complexity and size um, according to the amount of energy flowing through it. And the, the, the energy dynamically structures it, so that's, that's what makes it a dissipative structure. And like all dissipative structures, it relies on that external source of energy. That's, that, that, that energy has to keep flowing. And in fact, it has to flow in increasing amounts. And I can unpack why that is but I just want to give the broad overview. Um, and so we have uh, a highly abstract system with all these artificial roles that people occupy, you know, like, um, like member of the National Committee, for example. Um, uh, and, and we have this problem solving dynamic and we need energy to be constantly flowing through the system in order for it all to work. Those are the three essential characteristics of a civilization. You've got to have each one and they have to work together or there is no civilization. But if you have those three things, then you've got a civilization going. Why do civilizations die? Well, it has to do with each of these three essential features. Let's talk about the dissipative structure aspect first because that's kind of the most obvious. You have to have that reliable source of energy to maintain the system, to keep it going. If you get more energy than you need, then you grow. But when you grow, you increase the day-to-day -day cost of maintenance, right? Because it costs it costs just to, to stay alive. You have to eat just to keep your body going in addition to getting the calories you need to go hunt more. Um, you have to, once you've built a new road, you have to repave it occasionally. Once you've created a new social role, you have to institutionalize it and pay salaries and so on and so forth. So, so anytime the structure grows, usually in response to new solutions to old problems, it increases the cost of running the structure. And that never stops because the situation is never static. It just keeps going. And, you know, as we know, you can't grow forever in a finite space. And the earth is a finite space. So 
even if we could somehow magically continue to get all the energy we needed to run it, eventually we'd just get too big. For one thing, we'd drown in our own waste. Yeah. But the reality is that we know that we can't keep getting more and more energy. In fact, um, global energy production peaked in late 2018, and it's now headed inexorably down. Oh. Um, that's the one of the primary drivers of the current war in Europe and uh, and is one of the primary drivers of the upcoming great financial crisis, which uh, uh, people more and more and more are starting to, to uh, talk about being just around the corner. You never know about these things. One of my favorite... Uh, uh, examples when talking about these things is it's always like playing Jenga, right? You know the tower is going to fall, but until it does, you don't know exactly when and you don't know exactly in which direction. That, that's that's how these things go. So we, we have uncertainty. We know things are going to fall, but we, we don't know exactly how or when or why. And anyone who says they do know, they're kidding you. Okay. Um, so then that's the dissipative structure problem. The It's, it's part and partial with the problem-solving issue because... Um, Problem solving suffers from what's called diminishing returns. Um, when you solve initial problems, you know, early on in a system, it really increases its efficiency. It makes it possible for it to grow more. It gets a better, better energy return on its investment uh, in, in energy to run it. Um, but as things go along, the benefit from each new solution to the newly existing problems is more and more marginal. It becomes less and less. And there's a famous book by an anthropologist named Joseph Tainter called The Collapse of Complex Civilizations, in which he unpacks this process in great detail uh, using many historical examples. And I recommend it if this is something that really interests you. So we have the dissipative structure problem of, of running short of energy. We have the problem solving situation where we're constantly creating new problems, but the solutions we come up with are less and less effective at solving those problems. And eventually we reach a point where we face usually existential predicaments that we have no solution to. And that leads to the third issue, and that is our abstract institutions. Because those institutions are abstract, they kind of exist on faith. Um, you know, a dollar has value because everyone agrees that it does. Otherwise, it's just, you know, more than, no more than a piece of toilet paper. Right. Um, the, a, a prime minister is prime minister because people say she is and act accordingly. If they stop doing that, it doesn't matter what she calls herself, there's no longer this office of prime minister. What happens when a society or a civilization reaches the point where it can no longer solve its predicaments and it no longer has the energy for maintenance and begins to fall apart, then people lose faith in those institutions. The, the very language that built them is called into question. People start speaking past one another, speaking a different language, using the same words, but with different meanings. Take, for example, the different ways that freedom is used by uh, you know, conceptually by different political groups. And you think about the political polarization that's taking place all around the world, United States, Europe. Um, the, the language and the faith that goes with it that holds those institutions together begins to fracture. And at a certain point, the society no longer will sustain its institutional integrity. Um, and when that happens, then you get a very rapid uh, complexity collapse of the very structure of, uh, of the civilization itself, because the institutions fail, the institutions collapse. Um, we've seen that, of course, many times historically. It often happens in different places regionally, but it can also happen to a whole civilization all at once. And when it occurs, you know, we give it big names like the fall of Rome, right? Um, but uh, that's, that's the pipeline we're looking down now. And it really helps to explain a lot of the things that are going on now. So that, that's the shortest answer I know how to give. Uh, uh, brief, but uh, profound, for sure. Um, and all of that makes a lot of sense to me. I Having, you know, like a paper away from a master's degree in system science, uh, you're just basically describing, like, everything I learned. Uh, mm -hmm. Not everything, but most of what I learned. I mean, one of, one of the adages, um, if you will, or, or sayings in system science is all current problems are caused by solutions to previous problems. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you're like you're like oh my god that's true you know mm -hmm. and it just it's kind of just sense it gives you this sense of dread and futility um mm -hmm. but uh, <laughs> and, and that sets up the horrible dynamic of reaching a point where you've got all these problems you've created and you can't find any solutions and then, right. then, and, and, then and, you're up against the wall exactly and the more complex another one too was uh um concerning complex systems uh, mm -hmm. uh sufficiently complex systems tend to be 
tend to run more efficiently when decentralized. And there's all sorts of tendencies in there. And what was happening now is because we're trying to solve so many global problems, we keep centralizing the, 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 the commanding uh, problem solvers. Um, and I don't know how that's going to work out so well. Um, um, so that's, I mean, that's not something that you address, but I mean, there is, I mean, complexity, you know, the KISS, keep it simple, stupid is, is really a profound thing for people, a very wise mm -hmm. thing for people to adhere to. Um, let the mind be complex, let physical reality around you be simple. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's how I live my life. I'm very much a minimalist. I can put every physical thing I own in the back of my truck. Um, but I keep my mind as active and as possible. Um, I think that's just a better way to be personally, but okay. Um, that's very interesting. So how, what's you see, you mentioned something like a certain amount of followers and, and, and subscribers on your YouTube thing. Uh, how long have you been doing the videos for and like what? You well, as I say, the, the, the first right. talk, which was videotaped and we put up online was in 2018. Okay. Uh, and then again in 2019. Uh, and then I've done several interviews um, because once those videos became popular, there's, there's what's called a doomer community, right? Um, people who are ready for, you know, the end to come. Um, and right. uh, so, you know, I, I did some interviews with different people. Uh, there's a really nice fellow named, uh, by the name of Michael Dowd. Um, he's a minister and he really talks a lot about how to deal with uh, the fact of collapse, you know, from a human point of view and from, from the point of view of, okay, here I am in this situation. How do I deal with this on a personal level? Um, and so, so that was very nice, but there are a lot of folks. Um, and so I did some interviews. And then, as I say, I'm creating these new videos um, because there's so many people have asked so many questions. And it's clear that a lot of this stuff needs to get unpacked, especially in the present moment, um, because 2022 has turned out to be one of the watershed years uh, in, in the way collapse is unfolding in this civilization. So uh, in the present moment, people are really looking for a handle right on the moment to see if they can wrap their heads around it. Yeah, I think also like just the pandemic kind of just really took a toll on a lot of people it did sentences. it did it also it also masked a lot of the uh stuff that was going on at the time many people aren't aware that in late 2019 we hit a mini great financial crisis um you know the fed was was tapering off of quantitative easing trying to to shut off the uh, the tap so to speak for all that easy money for the financial system and in 2019, they had a very near miss with another threat of the kind of thing that happened at the end of 2007, where all of a sudden the financial system just freezes and everything breaks. Uh, and if you go back and look at the money supply, you'll see that in October 2019, they injected a huge amount of liquidity into the financial system to prevent that from happening. Um, but things were teetering like mad. And then COVID hit and everything shut down. So the fact that we nearly had another great financial crisis, the fact that we'd already hit um, peak energy production globally in late 2018. All of those things got obscured by the crisis of COVID. Um, but now that COVID has has ceased to be quite the crisis that it was, um, people are inclined to think that all these current problems are a consequence of COVID, and they're not. Uh, they were already happening. And uh, it's the fact that we're coming out of those lockdowns and the economy is trying to restart that is throwing up all of these new crises. Yeah, no, that's uh, extremely interesting. Um, and you're right. I don't think a lot of people real realize that. The you know, thing, like you know, you have new presidents get you know get into office, and like they, they take a uh, uh, claim for um, and you know the economy on an upsurge, and people don't realize the complexity of economic systems, and they don't turn on a dime like that. I guess a tra there can be specific tragedies and and downturns that can happen very quickly, but. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, these complex systems, I mean, the, you know, you have the seeds of what's happening now from like back in the day, you know, and they, they, they tend to grow over time. Um, can you, unwrap, sorry, did you want to say something? Go. I was just going to say with respect to the economy in particular, I wrote an essay in 2019, uh, which you can find if you Google it or find my, my website, bsydneysmith.com, um, called Socialism and the Green Party, because there was a lot of debate going on, has been for a long time about you know, what is what is the role of socialism within the Green Party? Is the Green Party socialist? How socialist is it? Blah, blah, blah. Um, and so I wrote a long essay on that. And a, a big central part of that is called It's the Energy Stupid, um, playing off of <laughs> James, James Carville's old uh, quip, you know, during the Clinton years about it's the economy stupid. Well, right. the economy yeah. is the energy. And if you don't understand the role of energy in the economy, then you don't understand the economy at all. Because the economy is not a financial system. It's an energy system with a, a financial veneer laid over the top of it, right? 
but that financial veneer depends entirely upon what's going on in what we call the real economy, the movement of, of goods and services and materials, essentially the use of energy. So if you don't understand the role of energy in the economy, it's all very mysterious. A couple of outstanding resources for understanding that, I'll give you three names. Uh, Tim Watkins writes a blog called Consciousness of Sheep. He's uh, writing from England, um, outstanding resource on this material. Um, uh, Tim Morgan, also British, I think, writes the uh, um, Surplus Energy Economics blog, um, which you can find by Googling that. And then uh, above all else, uh, John Michael Greer, um, who uh, lives here in the States in New England uh, and has been writing on all of these issues for a couple of decades now, uh, has my sincerest admiration. He's brilliant um, and can really help unpack all these things. And we can but find yeah, all these names on your, on your website? I don't have those linked on my website, but if you look for those those three things, uh, Consciousness for Sheep by Tim Watkins, um, Surplus Energy Economics by uh, Tim Morgan, and um, echosophia.net is uh, J.M. Greer's blog. He's an interesting guy. He's, a, he's a, a Druid high priest, and so he alternates on his blog between writing about Druidism and magic and writing about the rest of the world, and his I, I'm, I'm not a Druid, so I, I don't read many of the, the magic <laughs> blogs, but his stuff about... Um, energy and the economy and history. He's really got a great handle on the present moment, all the stuff that's been going on this year, the war in Europe and all that. Um, so highly recommended. Really that's very cool. Cause John, John Michael Greer, uh, that name sounded familiar when you said it. And now I know exactly who you're talking about. Cause mm -hmm. I, I'm not a Druid neither, but I've been heavily involved in like, you know, that side of spirituality since I was a youth mm -hmm. and still mm -hmm. up to this day. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's not, it's not Druidism, but I, I get it. Okay, so that's very cool. Um, so could you unravel a bit about the 2018 was the peak energy thing? Because that's, oh, that's a little okay, sure. So and the how it ties energy, to war. Yeah, so um, our civilization, industrial civilization, um, has its beginning in the late 18th century with the invention of the heat engine. Right. Um, by heat engine, I mean engines, machines that turn heat into work. Right. Um, so the steam engine is an obvious example. All those external combustion engines like the old, uh, you know, steam trains where they were shoveling coal into the into the back of the train and all that. Um, and internal combustion engines uh, and more recently, more more exotic types of engines, um, turbine engines and so on and so forth. They all are machines for turning heat into work. And that we learned how to do that in the late 18th century. Um, we, we built other machines to do work, but they didn't harness heat. They harnessed the wind or they harnessed water. Um, you know, those are those are hundreds of years old. But machines that harness heat, that was new. And uh, all of a sudden, people said, hey, you know, you remember those really hard, flinty black rocks we found jutting out of the hill over there? Those things will burn forever. Let's try those out in the steam engine. That's coal, right? right? Um, <laughs> and... Uh, and that bubbly stuff that comes out of the ground, you know, we can, the, all, all those folks in Germany who were learning all about chemistry in the 18th and 19th century, they could figure out how to turn that into a really efficient fuel. So the end of the 18th century and through the 19th century, we had the age of coal and this huge expansion of industrialism, first in England, then across Europe and in the United States. Um, and that coal civilization, coal-based civilization, industrial civilization really peaked um, around the turn of the 20th century, so about 120 years ago. Uh, and when it did, um, Britain went from being the most powerful uh, country in the world um, to a sudden collapse of empire. Uh, and by the 1930s, it was, it was extremely weak. Um, and the United States had discovered domestic sources of oil, um, huge huge amounts of oil, especially in Texas. Um, at the same time, the chemistry had come to the point and the engineering had come to the point where that oil could be used to create much more powerful and more efficient engines than you could ever do with coal. And so the oil age took off, but now it was US centered rather than, than British or, or European centered. Um, coal didn't peak in the usual sense. It, it hit a peak, but it was conventionally mined coal, where you dig a hole and send a bunch of guys down it, and they sort of tunnel around like rats, right? Um, later on, they decided to just take whole mountains apart. Um, and so we got a lot more coal that way than they did back in the day. And coal was still a very important so, source of fuel, but it was really oil that drove 
um, the modern world. The modern industrial civilization runs on diesel, um, whether it's it's tractors growing your food or trucks or ships uh, moving products around or or aircraft or anything else. It all goes on diesel. Gasoline is a byproduct of diesel. Um, you, you, when when you process to get diesel, you get gasoline as a byproduct, and that's why oh, we all have that. gas to put in our cars. Um, Right. So the United States controlled the oil market until 1970 because we were producing huge quantities of oil from these really easy to get to wells that produced all these gushers. And so we set the price. The, the Texas um, uh, oil board, they just decided what oil was going to cost all the way around the world. And it was dirt cheap for Americans because we had it all. Um, and that was great until 1970 when conventional oil in the United States peaked. That was the last year. That was the year when we produced the most conventional oil in the United States. And from there, it inevitably went downhill because it's a finite resource. And anytime you use up a finite resource, you hit a point where you've produced as much as you can produce as fast as you can produce. And after that, you're digging up the dregs from the bottom. Um, so that was when the Middle East took over the OPEC countries, especially Saudi Arabia, because they had the greater amount of oil. Um, that's what caused the oil crisis of 1973 because. Um, suddenly the United States no longer controlled the price of oil. Somebody else did. And, oh, and, that price is um, and that continued until 2005 with some variation. Um, you know, we learned how to build oil platforms out in the middle of the ocean. We found oil in Alaska. The British managed to find a whole bunch of oil in the North Sea, and that drove their heyday in the 90s and early 2000s. But in 2005, conventional oil peaked globally. That was the year in which we produced the world produced the greatest amount of conventional oil. And after that, it started to go into decline. And that is really the underlying cause of the dynamic that unfolded in 2007 and 2008 um, with the great financial crisis. People who think that the economy is a financial system think it had to do with bad loans and banking. But those were a symptom. The underlying cause was a decline in the supply of energy. In fact, we really never recovered from 1970 because from 1945 to 1970, the amount of energy available to industrial civilization increased exponentially on a, on a large curve. After 1970, it continued to increase, but no longer exponentially. It only increased on a linear pattern. And so our period of greatest expansion and greatest personal prosperity was in the 50s and 60s and early 70s. And since then, as, as anybody my age can attest, average personal prosperity has been flat or declined, and it's because of the energy situation. Um, in 2005, we had peak conventional oil, and uh, that led to the crisis. And we then managed to mask over the top of that with non-conventional oil sources. We started uh, getting tar sands from Canada. By 2014, we were pumping an enormous amount of oil out of fracked shale deposits in the United States. Um, and very briefly, the United States once again became the world's greatest oil uh, producer for about four years. Um, but in 2018, that had run its course and is already in steep decline. The fracked wells are in huge decline. Um, and in fact, it's worth pausing and talking about that just for a minute. It was never economically viable to get tight oil, uh, oil shale and, and tar sands oil, because you have to put so much energy into getting the energy out but the energy return on investment is too low. Consequently, you can't make money by investing in it. And what happened in the United States is that with the promise of, you know, this endless amount of oil that was going to be fracked out of these shale wells, um, the investment community poured $250 billion into getting all this oil out of oil shale. Um, and they never got that money back uh, because it cost too much to get the oil. So you can't make money investing in it. And consequently, uh, they're no longer investing in it because why would they do that? Right. And so the, the wells that would be needed uh, to produce more oil aren't getting drilled. Uh, and so in uh, late 2018, we hit peak oil totally around the world, uh, conventional oil and tight oil. Um, and at the same time, it's become obvious that the OPEC countries, especially Saudi Arabia, have also peaked because every time they promise to increase capacity, it doesn't happen. In fact, they haven't met their own quotas for a couple of years now, they're way below their quotas that they've set for themselves internally in OPEC. Uh, and it's because their wells have peaked. And so the amount of energy available to civilization is now permanently in decline. 
And I, I want to emphasize that the amount of energy available to us is permanently in decline. Now, people say, you know, we should probably talk a lot about renewable energy because I yeah. know a lot of people think that's going to save us. Um, and, and I'd love to do that. But let's just finish off the oil story. The, the world we have, the transportation and manufacturing and agricultural infrastructure of industrial civilization today runs on diesel. And the only way to keep it going is to figure out some way to either keep it running on diesel, and that can't happen because the amount of diesel is declining, or find a substitute that is as good as diesel for those purposes. And that doesn't exist. And so as a dissipative structure, we are now faced with what all dissipative structures face when the fuel runs out, the fire dies. And that's what's happening. Wow. That's, uh, that sucks. Well, yes and no. <laughs> you know, um, again, uh, remember, my video is how to enjoy the end of the world. Right. I wanted, I wanted to get to that eventually. Did you want to talk about well, it mean, about first? Because we're going to end it on a happy note. We're going to like, you know, how to, party, how to eat, live. A, who who right? likes our industrial civil? Who likes living in this civilization, right? Who likes living in the, in the oil age? I mean, God, it's it's awful, isn't it? It's pretty isn't it horrible. There's some perks I mean, for sure, but I mean, no, I, I get you every and, day. And, it's more, it's and, more and depressing, and it's destroying the world. Yeah. You know, the yeah. natural world. I mean, there's so many things to hate about it. Shouldn't you rejoice um, that it's finally coming to an end? Because it is, right? And and so that I mean, that's one thing. Um, and and the other thing is, uh, suppose it didn't. I mean, suppose that somehow. It turned out that there's some vast oil field that everybody's overlooked up to now and will keep us going for another 100 years. What would happen? Well, we'd kill the biosphere. We don't, want to, we don't want to keep burning that oil. We don't want to kill the biosphere because we're part of it. If it goes, we go. Right. Right. We can't live apart from it. So uh, we don't want to do that. Yeah. So there's, it, it's there's not a bummer that we've hit peak oil. It is, in fact... Finally, thank goodness, because otherwise <laughs> we can put us put this crap out of its misery. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, another thing too about like you know systems analysis and so on is is, is the exponential uh, increase of problems that happened uh, that happened. Um, I'm, I'm trying to gather my thought here. Um, you know, you like like you think of like uh, the glacier uh, on Greenland, right? Okay, like and mm -hmm. if like a little bit on the edges like melt off because the heat is warming up, the land is warming mm -hmm. up, that mm -hmm. heat transfers to the underpinnings, the underside of the rest of the glacier, which causes it to melt even faster. So on, so that water goes up into the air, it turns into clouds, it comes over to Iceland and dumps a bunch of crap on Iceland, which causes it also. I mean, it just goes on. And, you know, it just has to do with the interconnectedness of everything, which is mm -hmm, right. a mystically, magically beautiful, wonderful thing. And I love it. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, let's not uh, forego understanding the, the difficulties and complexities of that as well. Because, like, you know, it's just like a spider's web. You ting it over here, and it shakes over here. Um, mm -hmm. You have to remember that that's how reality is. Because a lot of what you're saying is, like, you're describing, like, real-world systems. I mean, this is how mm -hmm. systems go. All of them, right. all, all physical ones, um, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so, like, it's it's not it's not that we're we are doing it. We're we're definitely making it happen more rapidly. There's no doubt about that. It could mm -hmm. it could have been a lot different. It certainly could have been a lot different. <laughs> you know, it's not clear that that's true. Well, that's if you're if you're a, a determinist or not. Um, well, no, I don't think it's that. <laughs> See, that, there's a tendency for people to think that we somehow control this thing. And there's zero well, evidence reality. that that's the case, and and every every reason to believe that in fact nobody has ever had any control over it at all. Um, you know, if you if you pour fuel on a fire, it's going to burn the fuel. Right. And and uh, when when all that energy from all the fossil sunlight became available to civilization, you know, civilization isn't something that people plan. They don't design it. Um, they don't sit down and say, you know, let's let's have a civilization with, you know, powered personal transportation and, and representative democracy and, and and capitalist financial institutions. Let's do that. Nobody did that. It, it, there were a bunch of people who are as bewildered by the world as anybody is today who said, you know, it makes sense for us to do this right now because I can kind of see the benefit. And you know, it's like an anthill. anthill. Anthills aren't designed by ants. They're built by ants, but they didn't design them. They just did their ant thing. 
and and the anthill itself is an emergent property it's it's a property of complexity because of all these thousands and thousands of ants just interacting with each other the way that ants do civilization is an emergent property of human society we didn't design it we didn't set about to do it we don't control it it just arose out of the billions of interactions between billions of people and between those people and their environment and all of those people were simply acting in the normal way that human beings do so you know you can say well it could have been different well maybe if human beings were different maybe if the circumstances had been different but there was nobody back there who made some decision that set the course of civilization no person no group of people there were people who did things that we can trace the consequences of the things they did but it's not because they were setting out to to cause those things to happen and there's no way for us to know no way for anyone to know in any moment in any complex system what the consequences of your actions will precisely be as it unfolds into the future. That's the nature of complexity. So what we're faced with is what anybody has ever faced with, which is the present situation. You know, we have no freedom in the past. We have no freedom in the future. All of our freedom is in the now. And we have to look at our present situation and say, how shall I now act according to my understanding of what is the good? But that's what most people have done most of the time in most places. So... Sure. It's very problematic to say, oh, well, it might have been different because it's at best, it's extremely speculative. Uh, and no, it, works, it, describes to, it describes an agency to humanity that humanity doesn't have. There are massive epistemic limitations in each individual and even collectively concerning complex systems. I mean, you just mm -hmm. can't. Mm -hmm. That's, again, like going back to like, you know, civilization is a problem solver and technology is definitely a, a, a uh, a, a symptom or, or an effect of civilization. Uh, you know, we build computers to do things that the brain can't do as rapidly as as complexly complexly is that the word um, as as we can. I mean, the human mind is still, as far as neuronal synapses firing and so on and processing information, is extremely complex. Mm -hmm. um, but like the conscious understanding of things is a totally different ballgame. Um, well, and you know, none of it is to say that there haven't been greedy assholes doing horrible things. There have been, and they. And, no, this and isn't a moral no, no, yeah, There are not. lots of greedy assholes right now who are doing terrible, terrible things. <laughs> um, you know, as as uh, uh, as uh, God, I'm spacing on his name, but he said, you know, the Earth is being destroyed, and and it's being destroyed by people, and they have names and addresses, and you know, there's a lot of truth behind that. Um, you know, the, the the CEOs of the large companies are acting upon a set of values and a. And a, and a and, uh, and coming from a place of privilege that we really ought to try to put an end to. Right. Um, you know, that's that's on us to try to do that. That's why we wear this shirt. Um, but the idea that anybody could have controlled the outcome of civilization is is it's it's a it's a terrible road to go down. I think because you end up just kind of trying to play this blame game. Whose fault is it? Fair it's, enough. It's nobody's fault. Uh, but I think of things like let's let's just grant that DGR is it has a, a really good point in saying that agriculture is kind of where everything went wrong. I uh, started to go wrong. Um, have you heard of permaculture? I have. Okay, so mm -hmm. permaculture. I'm certified in horticulture, and I have a certification mm -hmm. in permaculture as well. And permaculture mm -hmm. is using what well, basically using the method methods that nature uses to grow stuff for ourselves. Right. Um, right. There's That's what I try to do in my own garden, actually, to, to the extent that I'm able to. Yeah. No. Exactly. It's 100 percent you know, as far as, you know, physics goes, uh, sustainable. Um, so like, I mean, I just sort of like imagining like at the start of our agricultural practices, like people like saying, well, let's just use hookah culture piles and, you know, and that kind of thing and bioswales and so on and so forth and how differently things would have turned out. But I understand what you're saying. We do all live within confined boundaries and specific uh, limitations of, of, of the material world that we can't go outside of them to do anything. We can think outside so, of it for sure. Here, here's a nice here's a nice historical thread, which I think is very illustrative and very instructive. You know, we all hate the modern commercial corporation and for very yeah. good reason, for the most part. Yeah. The, the modern, you know, the, the Exxons and the and the Metas and the, uh, the GMs and the Raytheons. I mean, these these are, are are powerful institutions in their own right that have far too much power. We shouldn't grant them that power. They do an enormous amount of damage. Very few people think about where corporations came from. And you have to go all the way back to the Middle Ages in the 12th century in Europe. Um, and, and, and I'm thinking this this came to my mind because you were thinking about, you know, DGR and, and you know, agriculture is the problem, which, you know, an argument can be made if, if, if you like being a hunter gatherer. But um, the, uh, 
the the situation in Europe was this. You know, the plow had been around forever. They invented it in the Middle East. Uh, you know, about uh, twelve thousand years ago, and it's really nice because you dig a, a thing in the dirt and put seeds in it, and they come up and grow. You can control the weeds and stuff. It works a lot better than just throwing seeds on the ground. Sure. Um, the problem in Europe is it's wet and muddy. And those old plows didn't work because they'd get stuck in the mud. And in order to cut through that mud, you needed a lot more power. And the only way to get that power was to hook a whole lot of oxen together. But if you're a farmer, you don't own eight oxen, right? You're lucky if you've got one. Maybe you and your neighbor own one together. And uh, so, I mean, there were some technological interventions. They invented the plowshare, right, that cut the sod in front of the plow. And they invented the mud board that turned things over. These were all great. But you still needed a big team of oxen to cut that soil. And farmers didn't own big teams of oxen. So what did they have to do? They had to get together. And they had to form agreements about how to pool all their oxen and take turns plowing one another's fields. And what that led to for the first time in human history, and again, remember our capacity for problem solving and our ability to create abstract institutions. What that led to was the nascent corporation, a legal entity to which all of these individuals belonged, but which existed in its own right for the sole purpose of making sure everyone's fields got plowed every year so you could grow enough food. And those legal, so this is the reason capitalism came out of Europe and not out of China or Egypt or Africa or someplace. It came out of Europe because they were the ones who had the need to form these collective cooperative enterprises to solve the problem of the fact that, you know, Europe tends to be a muddy hellhole about half the year. And so it makes it hard to cut the soil and grow stuff in it. And by the 13th, 14th centuries, of course, institutions had been created to um, make sure that the, the cattle that needed to be bought and sold could be bought and sold by the entity. Right? This is the nascent corporation and the banking system that grew up around it was to make all of that possible. And by the time we got to the colonial period, of course, then we had the great big companies, the East Indies and the West Indies companies and so on and so forth. That's what led to the whole idea of a corporation is, is making it possible for people who didn't have the resources of, on their own to do what needed to be done, to form a cooperative entity that could do it. And that little thread really helps to explain a great deal about the trajectory of our civilization. Again, those people didn't plan the modern corporation, but they created what was necessary for the modern corporation to exist. And you can see exactly how it developed over time. And at every step of the way, it was a solution to a problem that needed to be solved and helped people solve it and you know, grew food. So I, I think that kind of example is very illustrative. Yes, no, for sure. That's very, very well said. Um, we only got like seven or eight minutes left here, so okay. I want to hear about the the party, the party side. All right, it was mm. a good time and watch the world collapse. <laughs> well, <laughs> <clears throat> there are two things to say about this. Um, uh, probably for this audience, we, we well, maybe we do. Um, I, I made one video that I made very the very first one. It's a prologue, um, why you shouldn't let collapse get you down. And one of the things I talk about that is, is the two most common unhealthy ways to deal with collapse. One is false optimism, right? That technology is going to save us and renewable energy is going to save us. Uh, you know, something is going to go, you know, socialism is going to save us. There's all these different things that are somehow going to save us. They're not going to save us. Civilization is collapsing. It's already started. It's well underway. It's going to continue. Um, nothing to do about that. Um, the other thing is the people who get into uh, make a fetish of collapse, right? Who get into the whole doomism thing. You know, it's all over. It's all done. You may as well you know, we <laughs> stop having children because they'll never survive and so on and so forth. Um, <laughs> the fact is the future is completely uncertain. Just as it has always been, if you're a human being, it's completely uncertain. Right? You don't know what's going to happen. And, and the fact of the matter is, matter is, most human beings at most times have lived under the threat of annihilation. That's normal for human beings to live that way. Um, so don't think of this as something extraordinary in that sense. Um, the other thing is collapse takes a long time. Right? We may see some really serious disasters and catastrophes. And, and there's always the threat in the modern age of a nuclear war, um, especially at the present moment. Uh, but collapse will probably unfold in the way that it has generally unfolded for most large civilizations in the past as a series of crises and a step down in complexity and energy usage. And then everybody adapts 
and there's sort of a short period of recovery, and then there's another crisis and another step down, because what's going to happen, one way or another, it can't be stopped, it's just physics, is our civilization is going to slowly but surely decline and adapt and decline and adapt and decline and adapt until it is in balance with the amount of energy available to it. Right. Right. And the amount of energy available to it in the future is going to be far, 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 far less than we have now. But it will take time. And so as an individual, as someone who um, you know, wants to look toward a human future that is a good human future, and I think we should always be doing that, I think that's core just to being a human being, um, you know, we should be raising our families and we should be growing our food and we should be building our communities. I can't emphasize enough how critical that is, building our communities, especially locally, yeah. and adapting to the world as it unfolds around us. And boy, you can really live a full life that way. So you should. Well, there you go. All right. Very, that's very, very wise. Um, very interesting. Yeah, no, I started radio shows and the whole Green Party thing had a lot to do with lo locality and, and mm -hmm. local everything. Um, doing uh, growing guard, community gardens and so on and so forth, you know, seriously, that, that's, that seems to be where it's at. Um, again, going back to like the decentralization of systems, so like that, like, you know, concern yourself with your own node in the system and you, you can connect with other nodes as you grow, um, if you will. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you only got I mean, people... People have been making sustainable uh, communities for for many, many thousands of years. And look at the common system in Europe before the corporations came along and everything got privatized. You know, they had a common system that lasted for a thousand years. It was very sustainable. And people lived good lives. You know, we make fun of the Middle Ages. They were all dirty and unwashed. And served, but that's <laughs> not really true. If you really look at the Middle Ages, especially the high Middle Ages, it was almost idyllic for most people most of the time. They didn't have to work very long. There were lots of holidays. Um, you know, there was childhood disease, so it made it kind of a lottery whether you were going to grow up. But once you did, you lived a long, full life, and it was a good life. Um, you know, there's a lot of things in the modern world I hope we can take with us. Medicine is one of them. Um, but we need to get used to the idea that we don't have to have our own private steel chariot. We don't necessarily have to be able to keep our homes artificially lit all the time. You know, we don't have to do a whole lot of things in order to be um, uh, in, in a really fine, good world. A good human world yeah that, that is for sure uh, i think a lot of concern though is just as things collapse even slowly um that you're gonna find there's, gonna, I'm, there's no sugarcoating it there's going to be horrific suffering exactly because I mean, violence I mean, we, is we, going we, to be an outcome of socio-political economic collapse yeah, period. there, there are going to be wars and there are going to be famines right and that's, um, that's as you're say, as you were you were saying a minute ago, I was thinking about like uh, you know the energy shortage and stuff like that in uh, in Europe, and Putin's constant like saber rattling concerning you know nuclear uh, war. Uh, like I'm wondering, like I'm like, does he know everything that Sid is saying? So he's like, okay, well, let's in order to buy some time, like we don't have to take back back a couple parts of the Ukraine just for our own survival, and if we can't, screw it, we're just going to take everybody down. You know, well, you know, first of all, I, I don't want to get into the propaganda war, and that's what it is. Um, and, and if there were anybody whose ear I would love to bend, uh, it wouldn't be Putin's. It would be Biden's, um, assuming he's capable of hearing it. Um, <laughs> yeah, let's let's not talk about Ukraine. I'll just say that okay. yeah, yeah, it's a tragic, tragic situation. I hate the war. It's horrifically dangerous for all of us. And most of what we've been told about it's a lie. So I'll just leave it there. Okay, fair enough. All right, on, on that note, um, <laughs> we got like another 30 seconds left. Anything you'd like to end it with? You want to plug your website or anything? Um, well, you know, I, I love to hear from, from people on the, on the YouTube videos. So if anyone wants to leave a comment, if anyone has any questions, um, there's a, obviously we've only scratched the surface of most of these things. I'm sure a lot of people would like to hear more about the role of the Green New Deal, so-called, um, and, and why it won't stop what's coming um, and can't. And... Uh, why in many ways it's made things worse. We need to we need to rethink some of that. Um, there are a whole lot of things I'm sure that people would like to talk about. So, you know, we can do that. If not in this forum, then, then in some other. Absolutely. Well, and actually on that, on that note, I would love to have you back because as you said, we are just scratched the service here and I got 8 million more things to talk about with you. So, I mean, okay. there's all sorts of things that you brought up. I'm like, okay, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? So we need, to, we need to definitely have you back. Um, I look forward the, to it. That would be great. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody, for tuning into the Illinois Green Party series. I'm your host, David Rich, with a fascinating, fascinating discussion with 
B. Sydney Smith. Thank you so much, sir. Tip of the hat to Thank you, you. And all you do. This is fantastic stuff. Till next time, everybody, be good. Be green. And there's this awkward delay.